So good morning, everyone, and welcome to our January PTO meeting. I hope everyone enjoyed the vacation, the holidays. I'd like to wish everyone a happy new year. And we have a, a very important agenda today. We don't have any students today. We didn't think it would be ideal to schedule student presentations the morning we got back from a pretty long vacation, but in February, we'll definitely have some students involved. We are going to get started with updates from our PTO president, Jan Scott. And we have an addition that we didn't have on the agenda where we're going to add night and hand, which we're happy to add anytime for some updates as well. So Jan, good morning and welcome. And it's all yours. Thank you. Um, hope everyone had a good holiday. The PTO was busy the last week of school before the break, and we hosted our blood drive on December 20th. We were able to collect 24 pints of blood, which will help 72 people. So that was a good win for the local community. Um, I want to thank the volunteers who uh, donated their time to staff the table and to those who sent in items for the students to eat after they uh, donated. They were treated to breakfast, lunch, and lots of good brownies and muffins and snacks. So I'm sure they appreciated that before they headed back to class. Our next blood drive will be in March. So we'll touch base with you about that closer to the time. We'd love to get a few more donors um, to just uh, make it even more of a robust donation next, next time. Um, then we, we went on and did a holiday gift raffle for the teachers and staff. And with your PTO donations, we were able to purchase $300 worth of $10 gift cards to local Madison um, businesses. And then we um, put gift bags, 170 gift bags in all the teacher and staff mailboxes and 30 of them had a lucky golden ticket. Well, actually it was white, but I couldn't come up with a golden one, but a white ticket. And um, then if they were a winner, they went and picked out a gift card of their choice. I think they really enjoyed the surprise. I got several emails and a few postings on our Facebook page. So um, I think that was a great tradition. I wanna thank Tina Phelan and Mrs. Hart for sharing how they do that at their uh, at Polson because I think it was a great uh, surprise for the teachers. Um, other than that, just like our um, Facebook page, we're gonna try to keep everyone updated with senior events and any other pressing events that are coming up. And then I think our next big priority is night in hand. Uh, I hear that um, senior year flies after the break and I already felt like the first part is already flying. So we're gonna be at night in hand before we know it. So if you guys can just volunteer, Beth's gonna share with us what we can do to get it up and running. Um, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. And on behalf of the faculty and staff, thank you for the efforts of the PTO. It was definitely very, very well received. People are excited to go to their mailboxes. And if you work in a school, that's not typical. So very, very positive. And thank you again. Beth, you ready? I I am ready. I am Excellent. ready. Thank you for joining us this morning. We love the night at hand updates. Oh, thank you for uh, letting me uh, jump on. Um, I just wanted to make it kind of quick, but um, Sherry Farmer and I are co-chairing this event this year. Um, we're getting, we're in the process of getting everything launched. Um, so registration letters should be going out, invitations to the seniors um, by the middle of January. So um, you should look for, you know, actual letter mail in your mailbox that will invite all the seniors to this great event. Um, it is J uh, June 16th. It'll be the Friday night of graduation. Um, what we have launched so far is our design committee and our biggest fundraiser is the auction. So Liz Kench and Mary uh, Deduick are chairing up design and then Leah Grenier and Sarah Valentine are our auction chair committee. Um, what we're hoping is that we're going to put it out through Facebook again, but we have volunteer opportunities to join those great committees and to really launch the design and the auction is the biggest fundraiser for this year. So 
as we get our website updated and as the volunteer opportunities are there, we encourage everybody to join. Um, we also have Facebook pages for all the classes, 26, 25, 24, and 23. It is our main uh, vein of communication in addition to the e-notifies that will go out. So we are going to have class representatives who are going to be posting minutes from all the meetings that we're going to have to keep everybody kind of in the loop and to keep it kind of fresh so that everybody does know the opportunities are out there and to make this event as extraordinary as it has been in the past, we really do need all hands kind of on deck. Um, big, small, whatever you can donate um, makes the night that much more special for our seniors. Um, you can contact us if you have questions through nightinhandmain at gmail.com um, for volunteer opportunities, for questions that you might have, how you can get involved, what can you do. But we're really excited to get it going for the class of 2023 this year. And, um, you know, we're just looking for your support. Um, we will make appearances at these PTO meetings going forward um, as events get closer, as the excitement builds. So um, we're really hoping that um, everybody who hears this um, does take advantage of the opportunities to make this a success. Thank you. Excellent, Beth. Thank you for the update and obviously for your efforts in this very worthy cause. And just one quick reminder, I'm not sure everyone keeps in mind that graduation, no matter the number of school cancellations, that date will not move. And that was something that changed pretty recently. So that June 16th date stays the same. And you know, hopefully we have great weather and then we have a great night at hand that evening as well. Does anyone have any questions for Beth at this time regarding night in hand? If you do, feel free just to unmute yourself and jump right in. All right, and as Beth mentioned, she will be a regular contributor to our PTO meetings between now and our June 16th date. So we'll hear lots of updates and hopefully people do have some time to volunteer to help. So thanks again, Beth. We really you. appreciate your efforts as well as your time this morning. All right, our next agenda item, we have Jennifer Aguzzi, who's our world language coordinator, who has just done incredible work at Daniel Hand High School and brought the seal of biliteracy to hand last year. And we thought it was a great idea to either remind people of the seal of biliteracy or for some probably inform people of what the seal of biliteracy is. So Mrs. Aguzzi is going to take some time this morning to explain what we're talking about when we hear or say the seal of biliteracy and she'll be available as well if you have any questions. Jen, thanks for your time this morning. Certainly appreciate it. You should be able to share your presentation. So give that a chance. If not, I have it ready as well. Perfect. Good. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, so yes, the seal of bioliteracy is something that we brought to Daniel Hand um, last year. Um, and this is literally a stamp that goes onto the diploma that indicates that a student has proficiency, at least intermediate mid proficiency in two or more languages. So one of them is English, and then also an area of um, a secondary language. Um, in addition to the seal that's on the diploma, it's also indicated on the transcript. Um, and that's really important, especially for our seniors as they're applying to schools. So technically it's awarded upon graduation because students have to earn all of their English language requirements as well as their world, world language requirements. Um, but the second that they hit that mark for a foreign language, it is immediately on the transcript. Um, and that foreign language proficiency is assessed through a standardized test. There's a lot of different choices there with different score thresholds that are kind of confusing, but they all equate to the same thing, which is intermediate mid proficiency. And just to give you a little perspective on that, um, that's a pretty high threshold. In order to be a world language teacher, you need advanced low proficiency. So it's really only two notches below being a world language teacher. Um, which is, it, it's really pretty impressive for high school students to be able to do this. Um, okay, so we thought that it was a really important thing to bring to our school because it, it has just a lot of benefits and as far as I can tell, no downsides. Um, it can tell employers, you know, something that you can put on a resume and show employers that you're proficient in a second language. Um, any profession, 
people earn about $10,000 more per year if they're bilingual for the same job. Um, so for our students to be able to document on a resume that they're bilingual is a huge benefit to them. Um, it has the same benefit in providing universities you know, with some more information about the depth of knowledge of the students. And it also prepares them better for an increasingly global community. Um, it also can help strengthen intergroup relationships um, and can help placement in universities. Um, and we've even had some students who earn credit, university credit, just like they do for the AP tests or for UConn classes um, for passing the, the standardized tests for the seal by literacy. So last year was our first year and there were 37 uh, members of the class of 2022 who earned the seal by literacy in five different languages. Um, if you notice those 37 members, but 40 SEALs because we had a few students who earned them in two languages. Um, and already this year, we've had 56 members of the class of 2023 who have earned 58 SEALs in seven languages. Um, one person actually earned it in three different languages, which was awesome. And again, I wanna just give you perspective on this. It takes about 720 hours of language study for about 14% of students to reach this threshold. So 56 members is about a quarter of the graduating class. It's actually a huge, huge percentage of them. Um, and you know that 720, 720 hours of language study, they only got 480 hours in high school. So this is demonstrating a depth of study that goes far beyond what they're getting just at Daniel Hand. It's you know a credit to the students at Polson to, we have a bunch of heritage students and you know their families have done great work with them because it's not just about speaking, but being able to read and write, listen and speak in a second language. So we'll have um, additional administrations of the proficiency tests in the spring. Um, and we encourage people to register if they have you know, even if they're not likely to get the seal by literacy, it's still just this great feedback um, for us and for them about, you know, where their strengths are and where they can grow. Um, so heritage speakers of any language um, in grades 10 through 12 should register for this. Um, also students in grades 11 or 12 who have, who are in French five, Spanish five or Spanish six, or the fourth year of Mandarin or third year of Latin. And that's just because it, you know, they need more practice in order to get to a point where they're likely to get the seal by literacy. Um, seniors who took an AP language test last year actually already earned the seal by literacy. That's reflected in those 56 students who have already gotten this. Um, juniors who are registered for an AP language test this year should not register for the seal by literacy that you know, the other administration because the AP test will already cover that testing for them. Um, but seniors who are registered for an AP language test should register because their scores won't be back before graduation. Um, so that's a little bit confusing. If anyone has any questions about that, you can always email me um, with specific questions about your student situation. Okay. And lastly, just, you know, so how do I register? Um, we'll send an e-notify with a link to a Google form that's really simple. It's just the student's name, grade, and what language they would like to test in. And they're welcome to test in multiple if that's appropriate. Um, testing will be in late March or early April. We aim for about two weeks into the second trimester so that if they had a bridge, they can kind of get back into it before testing. Um, and I just want to point out that there's, there's no risk. If you don't earn the seal by literacy, it's not reported to colleges. We don't report to anyone unless it's yes, they earned this. Um, so there's always the, that possibility of reward with very little risk and no cost. So we really encourage students to go for this. Um, and the other piece is that, so the proficiency tests um, test four areas. They test reading, writing, speaking, and listening. If a student misses that bar in just one area, then we can retest them within 90 days um, at very little additional, but the school will cover the cost of that. So um, I think that's it. Are there any questions?
And one quick clarifier. So there are four parts for the assessment. If a student doesn't meet the standard in one, the retest within 90 days is in that one particular area, not all four? Correct. They only have to retest in the areas where they did not like meet that, that threshold. Great, thank you. All right, so great information. Does anyone who is in attendance this morning have any questions for Mrs. Aguzzi about the seal of biliteracy? Again, if you do, please just unmute yourself and jump right in. Jen, do you wanna take the presentation down? Great, and one of the things we started last year, just because we think there's a lot of benefits to this is recognition as well in graduation. You know, we do highlight students who have earned a seal of biliteracy in the actual program. We, they get a cord as well to wear over their gowns. And as you saw from the numbers that Mrs. Aguzzi shared, a lot of his students already, very impressive. And the hair students in three languages, for example, that's incredible, so great work. We will be sending an e-notify to all families, including students in the very near future for this opportunity. And there really is no risk, like Mrs. Aguzzi mentioned, like there's no negative if a student didn't earn the seal, for example, but there's definitely a lot of benefits. So very positive, Jen, thanks for your time. Great work, you know, those numbers are really impressive and it's nice to see so many of our students, you know, taking advantage of this opportunity. Thank you, everyone. All right, moving on to probably the bulk of our presentation today, we are in the process of starting to plan for the 2023-24 school year. And we have some updates in our program of studies. We're going to discuss a scheduling timeline and a revision to our school counselor's approach to working with students this month regarding the scheduling process. Fortunately, Mrs. Hawley is out today unexpectedly. I will cover her parts of this presentation. I'm sure it won't be as good as hers, but I'll cer certainly cover that part to review and then we'll wrap up with the actual process. So any of the parents who you know, don't have a senior, again, if you have a senior, this really isn't applicable. You will, you'll have a really good understanding of what we're going to be doing over the next month. And it goes by very, very quickly. So first and foremost, I'm gonna share my screen. If you can see this, I hope you can. We're going to go into just the changes that are going to be happening within our program of studies, which is live on our website right now. I'll show you how to visit that in at the end of this presentation, it's very easy. You just go to our website, click on parents, find the program of studies link, and it's an electronic document that has an incredible amount of information. I would highly recommend starting to take a look at that with your student or students in the very near future and not wait until the end of January because we'll start this process next week. I'll go over the timeline. It's one of the last slides of today's presentation. And the process actually ends before February begins. So it's not a long process, but obviously it's really important. So just a quick update regarding, or not update, just a review of graduation requirements that if you had a student who graduated in a class of 22, for example, or earlier, the, the requirements have changed. So you definitely wanna pay attention to this. For all students at hand and anyone who comes to hand from Polson moving forward, the minimum graduation requirements are 25 credits. It is worth noting that our students average 29 credits when they graduate. So getting the 25s isn't challenging. You have to just make sure the 25 credits are spread out as necessary. This slide details the STEM requirements. There are nine credits required in STEM. Within those nine, three and a half must be from math courses, three must be from science courses, and then two and a half come from any STEM designated courses that you see in our program of studies. And this little icon on the bottom right of the slide will indicate the courses in the math, science, and CTE portions of the program of studies. 
that are actually STEM courses. So you wanna look for that STEM icon when looking for those two and a half credits over the four years of high school. Humanities requirements are nine total credits. You can see the breakdown of English courses, four and a half credits. Social studies courses are three and a half credits. Of those three and a half credits, US history must be included. That's a one credit course, as well as civics and American government as a half credit course. Any humanities designated courses up to one credit is required. And you could see on the bottom right hand corner of this slide, that the humanities designated courses will have that icon next to them from all different departments, from art, English, social studies, you can read the rest as you take a look at this. But this is why we encourage you to you know, have some conversations with your student or students and review the program of studies before thinking about selections for the upcoming school year. There's additional requirements as well. World language courses, we require a minimum of one credit, although we recommend three or four years worth of world language courses. Physical education courses, there's a one credit requirement. Health and or wellness courses, a one credit requirement. CT courses, one credit. Art, music, or not and, theater courses is a one credit requirement. And there's also a mastery-based diploma requirement of one credit. And that one credit is made up of the two courses that are underlined, one being personal finance, the other being independent project. Those courses we highly recommend are taken during junior and or senior years of high school. Those will make up the mastery-based diploma one credit. And then any additional courses up to one credit. Now, obviously, the credits from the three slides total 25, but like I mentioned, we have students go far above and beyond with at least 29 credits on average. Students take a lot of courses here and we think that's excellent. That's one of the many benefits we believe the trimester schedule offers. So what we're going to talk about today, we're gonna to talk about the changes to STEM and humanities criteria for designation. That will be very brief. And then there's some minor to major changes in the departments that are listed on this particular slide. So certainly a lot of different changes. Again, some are just minor, like a title change of a course, or maybe a tweak to a summary of a course description. Others are pretty significant based on curriculum work that may be going on in particular areas. Mrs. Witcher will be joining me today in sharing you know, some of the changes. So we'll go back and forth. So thanks for taking the time, Mrs. Witcher, and feel free to jump right in. Thank you, TJ. Um, so a few of the changes that we want to talk about today, the major ones that TJ was talking about are mainly from the departments of art and music, and that's due to recent curriculum revisions that both of those departments had. So under humanities, I know he talked about um, all of the courses you possibly could earn humanities credit in. You'll notice in red, those are the new additions um, those are the new standards that we've added to humanities designated courses. So composition and theory, um, media art and visual art, those come directly from music and art curriculum. And then similarly, um, under the STEM designation for the same area. So we also have music technology included in STEM. So you'll see a little later in the presentation that we're now able to offer music courses that earn both humanities and STEM designation. So part of the updates that the art department did was they didn't just rewrite their courses, they actually rewrote their whole philosophy and their teaching methods and what they actually value. So when you go to the program of studies on the website, you'll see this written, um, but they updated their art philosophy. And then on the next slide, you'll be able to see that they also updated their delivery methods and their values. Um, really trying to focus on creating an environment of being an artist, not just like learning art, but what is it like to be in the art industry and actually being an artist. One of the new courses that they um, got approved by the Board of Education was a printmaking course. And so people might ask, what does printmaking entail? So you'll just be able to see a little bit of the units that are covered within this course. Um, definitely a focus on like social justice and being able to use art as a way for good to communicate um, to the world. 
In general, these are all of the new courses that can earn humanities credit in the art department. So if your um, child is taking any of these courses, they get their art credit, but it also counts towards a humanities credit as well. And um, this was a very minor change. I know TJ said there's some that are super minor. Um, this was a prerequisite change, basically just saying that students only need to complete one year of drawing before they can move on to painting. This will just allow more students to take painting a little bit sooner. Uh, similarly to the art department, there were a couple of changes in CTE. Um, this first change being super minor. Uh, they revised the name and they also revised the course description. Um, CTE does a really good job of trying to keep up with industry standard. So just in the subtlety of the name, moving from computer integrated from to computer aided is just more um, aligned with what the industry uses. A really exciting change for the CTE department, um, they partnered with Goodwin University. So students that are now going to take our technical drawing and specifications course, this course aligns with the course that's offered at Goodwin University and students will earn credit that's also transferable to Goodwin University. Um, and you'll see in the program of studies, the new course description for this course offering. Another minor change in CTE was just removing prerequisites. Anytime we talk about removing prerequisites, the rationale is truly just to increase access for students. So entrepreneur no longer has the prerequisite of um, taking intro to business. Students can just jump right in and take the entrepreneurship course. Uh, similarly to what I said earlier, this also is a very subtle course name change just to keep up with um, what's known for, for, again, just for the industry. And then these two courses were updated as in terms of the units of study that they cover and just to align with what's stated in the course description, which is actually being taught. The changes are subtle, but again, you'll just see those when you go through the program of studies. Great, Melanie, thank you. I have a couple of slides and then go right back to Melanie. The English department has one update for one of our senior electives. It has a new course name and a revised course description, combat literature, which a lot of students take. If a, you have an older student or currently a senior and you have a younger student as well and you're interested in them considering that course, the new course title is Attitudes Toward War, and there is a revised course description as well. So again, senior elective, but certainly a change in the program of studies within the English department. Mathematics department had a minor update. Accounting was a course that was offered that is no longer offered in the math department because that course is actually offered in the CT department. So a student can still take accounting. It would not count towards a math credit. It would count towards a CTE credit. And then a older course that has been in the program of studies that was time to just be removed, it wasn't part of the update of curriculum, is a course that was titled Computer Science Application and Development. That course is no longer in the program of studies in any particular department whatsoever. So similarly to the art department, the music department has uh, basically a full overhaul of the courses that they're offering. They're in the process of going through their curriculum revision. And so with that, Leah Stillman, who's the department coordinator, has been working with all the members of the music department um, to really be able to offer some really exciting new courses for our students. So you'll see a couple of classes removed, um, and then you'll see in a moment what they are being replaced with. So two new courses in this area of STEM, Introduction to Music Technology, and then Piano and Digital Audio. And the reason why these courses fit under our STEM category is the significant amount of technology that's used in these courses along with music. Students are really excited to get into our, our lab to be able to do some really um, advanced work in terms of technology, using computers, not just necessarily playing the instrument, but also designing, editing, et cetera. 
And then in humanities, we now offer a music theory course in composition, which is similar to what we offered in the past, but our AP music theory is completely new. So students that really wanna take their music education to the next level, they can now take an AP course, earn AP credit, uh, similar to what we offer in many of the other disciplines, but music's really excited to be able to offer that to their students. There are some small changes with regards to course names. So you'll see those changes there. So if your student was previously in, let's say the string orchestra, when you go and you look to register them for this year, you're gonna see string ensemble. Um, similar show choir band is now just called show band. Uh, the old course name and the new course name are both gonna be written in the program of studies. So if you know what your child has taken before and you're like, huh, I wonder what the name is now, um, you can look for the old name, but the new name will be listed as the main title. And then the, the previous name will be listed um, in italics for you to be able to see that. And then every single course description has been revised. So if your um, child has taken music here, maybe for the last two, three years, um, I encourage you to read the new course descriptions just to see how the curriculum's changing for them. The course descriptions are super exciting. Uh, the revisions that they're making are really exciting for our students. So I encourage you to read those course descriptions, even if, again, it's a course that your child has taken for a couple of years. Thank you, Melanie. <clears throat> Similar to music, the PE and health departments are currently in the process of revising the curriculum they offer in all of our PE and health courses. And this, this is a little different because there'll be a transition of students who are currently at the high school. They will have some of the courses that were actually are still in existence, but we're moving away from. But students coming in from Polson, for example, will have the entire new course offerings in PE and health. So it could be a little bit confusing. If there are any questions as your son or daughter or child is registering for courses, feel free to reach out to a counselor or to an administrator. We can certainly help clarify. But the PE and Health Department is in the process of removing PE and Health 9, that's currently a combined course, junior and senior health, that junior or senior could take that particular requirement, and self-defense will be no longer offered. Now, just keep in mind, if you do have a 10th grade student, for example, right now, self-defense will be offered next year. If you have an incoming student who will be a freshman, self-defense won't be an offering for that particular student when they get to grade 11. There are new course offerings in PE and health and wellness. We're actually separating the PE and health courses so they're not combined any longer. The first wave of these changes will impact the incoming freshmen they will have a selection of either personal fitness or recreational games. So we're trying to add some choice to the PE department, similar to some other departments that are having choice, for example, social studies in grade 10, students pick two electives out of six. We're trying to get to that same level of choice for our students. And then during either ninth or 10th grade, incoming students will take health one, and then when they're in grade 11 or 12, they'll take health two. So definitely some changes. This gives you somewhat of an idea of what it looks like for next year. So if an incoming freshman was filling out their course selection sheet, they would select either recreational games or personal fitness. Health one, they might take either ninth grade, preferably ninth grade, it could be in 10th grade, but you'll see how 10th grade in this particular diagram shows that our current freshmen will be automatically enrolled in PE and Health 10 next year. That just has to happen because we're transitioning into this new curriculum. The students who are in grade 10 will sign up for PE 11 or self-defense. And then Health 11, or excuse me, Health 2 can be taken either junior or senior year as we move forward. We'll pay particular attention when we speak with our students about the scheduling process. And it is grade dependent for these changes in the PE and health departments. And it will take a couple of years for the full transition. We are excited to see some actual choice for students in these particular courses, which I think the students will appreciate. They actually gave feedback on some of the courses we were considering. And we took that feedback very seriously and used that to write those new courses and what you'll see in the program of studies for the new courses 
all of them will have revised course descriptions, which we're really excited about. The science department has two very subtle changes. The first is a prerequisite change for biotech. Um, previously, students needed to be able to complete biology and chemistry. And the subtle change is that they do need to complete biology, but they do not have to complete chemistry. They could be concurrently enrolled in it. So you'll just notice that um, new prerequisite change. And the second change in the science department is that they had two classes. Um, TJ, I think you your display is like off. I think you're right. <laughs> something that I'm trying to figure out. I love technology. Should I hit start new? Yeah, I would probably hit escape and then it might be able to let you go back in. Aha, awesome, thank you. You're welcome. My notes hit the keyboard. Perfect. Thank you, sorry um, so about that everyone. The next slide, please. So these are the two courses that are being removed from the science department and uh, simply because these courses never ran. So it's not something that any of our students have ever taken. So we just removed them from the course offerings. Great, and sorry about that glitch, Melanie. We were going no along smoothly and then technology <laughs> happened. My error, sorry about that, everyone. All right, in our world language department, we have some exciting updates. We have new Yukon slash ECE designation for the courses that are listed below, Spanish Conversation and Cinema, AP Latin 4 and AP Latin 5, really great additions to our world language department. We also have a new course that we've been trying to get up and running for a few years now. We're very excited to be offering this starting next year. The course is Deaf Culture and American Sign Language 1, a student who is interested in this particular course, it's a one credit course, meaning it will meet for two trimesters, can sign up for this course and it would actually fulfill the world language credit requirement by the state, which is that one credit requirement. We anticipate students being very interested in this course. We, we have one person who is able to actually teach the course. So we're certainly going to make priority to upperclassmen who are interested in this particular course. I envision students taking this in addition to other world language courses. I'm not sure how many students will take only this particular course, but again, we're very excited to be offering this next year. And in the previous, in the 24-25 school year, actually, we're looking to have American Sign Language 2 offered as well. So really, really great addition to our world language department, as well as the fact that it does count towards the world language one credit requirements. So now for some of these nuts and bolts, and Melanie, thank you very much for sharing some of the detail of the changes in the program of studies. Just so you kind of have an overview, overview as a parent of a high school age student, on January 11th, which is a week from tomorrow, during our advisory lesson, we have a presentation ready to review with all of our students in a small group to go over these changes in our program of studies so they're aware. During that actual advisory lesson, students will get the course request form that has to be completed by each student, signed by parent and or guardian, which is really important to look at your students' requests as opposed to just signing that form. Teacher input happens as well. So, you know, there's certainly a lot of discussion that's going to take place from January 11th through January 27th. Over the weeks of January 11th through the 22nd, we're asking all students, parents, and teachers to work together and review the program of studies. Teachers will make recommendations in certain courses. Not all courses require teacher recommendations but we hope students really embrace the numerous opportunities offered in our program of studies. One of the changes that we are implementing this year, and Mrs. Hawley was going to discuss this, is really exciting. In previous years, the school counselors met with small groups of students to speak about the scheduling process and answer any questions students had. 
prior to submitting their course requests. This year and moving forward from this year, school counselors will be meeting individually with every student in grades nine through 11 prior to the students submitting their course request entries. So it's a lofty goal. They're excited for the opportunity, but every student in grades nine through 11 will meet with the school counselor. Now, January 22nd is a Sunday. On that particular date, probably around four o'clock PM, I'm going to send an e-notify to the student body as well as all parents and guardians that details how to enter course requests into Infinite Campus. So students will actually log into Infinite Campus on their own and enter the courses that they're requesting for the upcoming school year. The deadline for entry is January 27th. That's a Friday. And it's a pretty simple process. It's step-by-step -step in the details that I'll send out on January 22nd. And once they hit submit, that process is complete. By the end of the school day on January 27th, students should hand in the course request forms as well as the override forms if it's applicable to school counselors in person in the school, literally just dropping them off in the school counseling office. That's a pretty typical timeline for how we schedule. The big change this year outside of the additions to the program of studies are the fact that we're having students actually enter their course requests on their own, on their own time. Last year, we did it in smaller groups with counselors to walk them through the process. Students were great and we don't see any need for that. So a student should not even consider entering anything on January 27, 22nd. Mr. Bodner is going to talk about the scheduling process in a moment, just so you're aware, but there's certainly time to start looking at the program of studies and to start having those conversations. So before Mr. Bodner shares just the details, so it's not overwhelming, because I do know the scheduling process could be, does anyone have any questions on the program of studies information that Mrs. Witcher and I shared? All right, Mr. Bodner, if you want to jump in and just explain the scheduling process a little bit so parents are aware as we get into this again a week from tomorrow. Thank you, TJ. To um, begin with, the, a point that I make each year when, when I talk about the scheduling process is that when we um, complete the master schedule and when we develop it, it is a whole school process. It's not um, individually run, meaning that when all the requests as TJ um, had highlighted are entered by January 27th, and we then go through to make sure that everything went in correctly, Eventually, at some point in early February, I would go into Infinite Campus and begin the master scheduling process, working with the close to 10,000 requests at this point in time, the size of our student body that will be in the system. Um, we also obviously will wait for our eighth graders selections um, to come over, which come over a little bit later prior to my doing that work. So one of the things, again, that I always just want to highlight is that when we are building the schedule, it's built up around the requests that are received. So the number of requests that we receive for a particular course determines whether we run that course, whether we have you know, one section or two sections. Obviously, courses that are requirements um, will run more sections because of the fact that we'll have an entire grade level perhaps requesting that course. So there'll be plenty of sections being run. But again, um, it's important to realize that it's a whole school process. And one of the things that TJ touched upon, for instance, when he talked about our new world language course is where he mentioned that upperclassmen would have priority. That is the case when registering for any electives. It's an algorithm that is built into Infinite Campus and all high schools um, scheduling processes work the same, where if students are requesting an elective, an upperclassman being that they have limited time to be able to take that course, get first priority. So one thing in talking about priority that I just want to caution people on is not entering um, one selections earlier, feeling that it's going to give anyone an advantage. It, it will not. So please encourage your children to take their time reviewing the program of studies, 
reviewing the prerequisites that exist for some courses and making thoughtful choices. Again, when everything has been gathered is when I go into Infinite Campus and begin the process. So a student jumping in on January 22nd when they receive an e-notify from Mr. Salutary and trying to enter their selections in that day, again, will in no way um, give them an advantage over anyone else. So please encourage them to be aware of what they're signing up for and to really review the program of studies that TJ and Melanie reviewed. One thing that is important is that when students do submit their choices, that they include any course that they are going to turn an override form in um, after they have completed their selections. Because again, after they enter them themselves in Infinite Campus, they will still turn into um, the counseling department their sheet along with um, any override forms for courses that they may not meet the prerequisites but want to take that course and they're submitting that form. The last thing again that I um, just want to highlight is if anything you know changes dramatically after a student submits all that information to please reach out to um, you know your child's counselor to let them know meaning that as you know we go deeper into the process if there is a change of mind on a course that they um, selected to let us know so that we can make adjustments and hopefully um, you know if it's a case where they're looking to get into a different course perhaps um, find room for that um, that really in a nutshell is, is just a quick overview of how the scheduling process works and like um, you know, TJ and Melanie had asked if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. Thank you, Mr. Bodner, very detailed process. And Jan, I agree with something you said at the beginning, like the fact that we're talking about this right now just proves this year is flying by because we get right into it. And again, just be on the lookout for a lot of information coming from us. I am going to attempt to share my screen again to see if I could show one quick piece. Just give me a moment. If you go to our website, can we actually see this? And under parents, program of studies is almost at the bottom on the left. If you click on this particular link, this is the access to our full program of studies. We no longer make copies. It's a document used for only a couple of weeks, costs a lot of money. And we're trying to preserve the earth a little bit as well. So every bit of information you ever wanted to find is in this document. Melanie Witcher spends an incredible amount of time working with the coordinators to get this up to date. There is different links, lots of information. Program planning is one you may want to look at in the beginning. You can pay attention to the time management planner to see what your child does before and after school to see if there's time to take all the courses because within the program of studies, it does detail the amount of workload we would expect a student to have after school hours, especially for courses that have 45 minutes to an hour of homework expectations on a daily basis. You can do a four year educational plan to look at particular courses that maybe an incoming freshman wouldn't get because they're so popular. A student appeal for a change in schedule that's once the school year begins, but we have mentioned the override application a few times. This is an application if your student's teacher recommends, you know, a level two math course and your student and you would think that a level one would be better. There's no reason to get into any arguments with the teacher. You literally print out this course, fill it out and submit it at the time of February 27th. Your, your child would actually enter the override request course into Infinite Campus and we will check that out to make sure that students' schedules match what their selections were. So it's a very, very user-friendly process that, again, it's, it's an immense website with details that would take a long time to go through. It even looks nice on a cell phone. 
So I would encourage those types of reviews. You know, I, I had two teenagers go through high school and I, I know they don't love going through the program of studies with parents typically, but I would have them really take a look at the offerings that are available. One thing worth sharing as well, just so you have an idea, the course request forms, this is what students will get when they are in advisory next week on Wednesday. This particular one is for grade 10, and you can see student's name, their counselor, their advisor. It talks about a minimum of 6.5 credits yearly. There's a four course minimum per trimester. We encourage five courses every trimester, not four. Parent guardian signature is required on this request form. And they literally, in English, look in the program of studies, write the course number, course title, credit is for their use. And then if the teacher and student are in agreement and if any comments are necessary, and then student name, parent guardian signature is submitted to school counselors on the 27th. This is the actual form that students should be working off of when they enter their information in Infinite Campus. I would highly recommend as a parent or guardian that you look at this form before your student or students enter these course requests. Mid-February, the school counselors will mail a list of the courses that students have signed up for to individual parents and guardians. So you can check that one last time before Mr. Bodner starts the scheduling process. Now, that process takes months and again, changes do happen, but the most accurate and up-to-date information Mr. Bodner has when we start results in a very positive outcome where a very, very high percentage of our students get the request they're hoping to have for the upcoming school year. So that is a pretty detailed overview of our scheduling process as well as all of the changes in our program of studies. Does anyone have any scheduling questions that we could answer right now before we wrap up this particular agenda item? If you have a senior, you're probably saying, I can't believe my child is not going to do this this year, but they'll be doing that if they're going to college. It's a pretty similar process electronically. So it's good experience as well for them, you know, as they make that transition, if they choose, you know, obviously post high school studies. All right, so last, just as an informational piece, our last agenda item, was just an update we're really excited about. Dr. Cook sent an email on Friday and included this information, but our student leadership group has been working to get approved to host a TEDx talk at Daniel Hand High School. And our first actual application was denied. It needed a few revisions and the student leadership group took it on and did some revisions and we actually got approved for an official TEDx talk at Daniel Hand that's scheduled on Friday, March 10th of this year. Really exciting. If you did not read Dr. Cook's email last or just before vacation, if you open that email and take a look, I'll have a similar message. We're looking for speakers who are interested in delivering a TEDx talk. And again, this is a real TEDx. This isn't like, you know, a Daniel Hand TEDx. This is official, probably 4 million viewers, which will be pretty exciting. And the theme is that makes two of us. So it's pretty broad. Speeches can be delivered in shorter increments of three, six, nine minutes, all the way up to 18 minutes. That's the maximum. We're looking for a minimum of 11 speakers, a maximum of 21 based on our time frame. We're hoping to have four or five of our students actually be speakers, but we're looking for some local adults to actually be consider being a speaker. The invitation that was sent out on the Friday before the holiday vacation had the ways a, any adult can sign up to actually be considered to be a speaker. And we have a group of students who will re review the applications for those people who are interested in speaking. And we'll confirm that in the very near future. Pretty exciting. You know, we've talked about this for a couple of years with student leadership. The fact that it's up and running right now and the potential for this to happen is great. And we're really excited about it. So if you are interested in being a speaker, the, the application will take you minutes to fill out. 
if you know someone in the area or even outside of the area who might be around on March 10th, it's an in-person event, feel free to forward the information in the email and have them sign up to be considered to be a speaker. It's a really unique opportunity. You know, it happens at high schools. I don't know if it's happened to any Connecticut high schools. I'm sure it has, but we were pretty excited about the opportunity and we just wanted to share at a PTO meeting as well. Unfortunately, only a hundred people are allowed in attendance to actually watch the event, but obviously it will be broadcast and then available, you know, through obviously the TEDx website soon thereafter, if anyone wants, wants to view any or all of the actual presentations that day. Any TEDx questions anyone may have? All right, so I want to thank everyone for their time, obviously attending today's PTO meeting. And this meeting is being recorded, so I'll send it out in my weekly message on Friday. Just want to say Happy New Year once again, and I appreciate everyone's time and obviously your support as well. Thank you all, and Brian and Melanie, thank you, as well as Jenna Guzzi, thank you for taking the time to share today. Have a great day, everyone. You too, thank you.